Moi moi, tervetuloa. No niin, etupekki. Yritetään... Ihan muutama minuutti päivää ja iltaa. Tervetuloa kaikki. Otellaan vielä muutamia henkilöitä tänne ja sitten me aloitamme. Mutta Taro tarjoaa teille pienen rinkin. Tässä on alkoholitonta mustaherukan lehdistä tehtyä juo. Toivottavasti se mais Quiet. <laughs> 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 
Täällä on nyt Täällä on tuolla eturivin paikka. Ei, mä niin pitkään, että kukaan näen mun. No tuu siihen, mä näen sun lukset läpi. Varoitko tätä liveä? No kyllä sä oot aika pitkä. No niin. <laughs> No niin, mä luulen, että me odotellaan, jos tulee joku vielä, mä luulen, että on tulossa vielä joku henkilö, mutta me joudumme kyllä aloittamaan. Hyvää, oikein paljon tervetuloa teille kaikille. Minä olen Jouni Seppänen, tämän yrityksen toinen osakas. 26 vuoden ajan ollaan tässä toimittu. Me ollaan omistettu tämä yritys, joka on 216 vuotta vanha. Me ollaan erikoistettu valtion johdon, ministeriöiden ja, ja lähetystöjen palveluun yli sadan vuoden ajan. Kun tätäkin hommaa Suomessa, reunavaltio Euroopassa, niin ajatellaan kukkia ja Suomi, niitä ei hirveän paljon yli ja usein yhdistetä, mutta meillä kukka, terve. Tervetuloa. Mutta meillä Suomessakin tarvitaan kukkia, me ollaan yksi ja tämän, tämän hetken maailman parhaita osaajia, kukkasidonta osaajia, eli kansainvälisessä kilpailussa, jossa sitä mitataan, meillähän koirakilpailut on tuttuja. Aina jos maailman voittaja sattuu olemaan oma kasvatti, niin sehän tekee sen mukavan tuntusta. Ja, ja samalla tavalla myöskin me kukalalla kilpaillaan maailmanmestaruus, Euroopan mestaruus, Pohjoismaiden ja Suomen mestaruuksista ja niin edelleen. Sillä tavalla kilpailun kautta on yhtymän kohtia myös. Me ollaan taas sitten Puolissonin kanssa kasvatettu tiipetys että yli 30 vuotta. Ja, e- sillä tavalla tämä koiraharrastus kulkee tässä kukkien sivussa. Kukat on vienet minua esiintymään ympäri maailmaa ja samalla sitten on ollut mahdollisuus tutustua myöskin kasvattajia ympäri maapalloa. Ja ää, tavallaan tukee, hyvin, hyvin tukeneet toisiaan nämä harrastukset. En olisi koskaan voinut kuvitella, että tämmöinen tilanne on edessä, kun on tänä päivänä. Rova Anne Vinyard, joka oli edesmennyt Predil Kennel, brittikasvattaja, jonka varmaan jokainen tuntee lähestulkoon. Hän on tehnyt myöskin Rocks of Tibet-kirjan, tieteellisen, historiallisen kirjan, joka on tiibettiläisten rotujen yksi semmoinen merkittävä epos. Me tutustuttiin ja tunnettiin toisemme yli kymmenen vuotta ja olen valmistelemassa postuumisti hänen viimeistä kirjaansa, jonka yritän saada valmiiksi tänä vuonna. Mä olin 16 vuotta hänen kuolemansa jälkeen sitä tehnyt. Teksti on hänen, kuvat on minun ja, ja, ja sillä lailla tuommoinen kirjakin on tulossa. Mutta en olisi voinut kuvitella, hän on käynyt tässä tilassa myös kaksi kertaa. Ja hän antoi mulle lahjaksi Doc Breeds kirjan, joka on Juliet Canlifin. The book. The book. The book. Ja. The book you wrote. The book. Yes, I was telling about the book. Ja tänään semmoinen ympyrä sulkeutui, että hän, hän tota kirjoitti sinne nimensä, sinne kirjan, kirjan sisäkanteen. Se on jotenkin herkkä hetki. Näin. Koiraharrastus yhdistää meitä kaikkia ja tämä meidän tila 
on ollut erilaisten rotujärjestöjen, erilaisten yhdistysten kohtauspaikka aiemminkin. Muun muassa Ladies Kennel Club on ollut täällä ja, ja pieniä tämmöisiä luentoja tai esittelyjä tehty eri aiheista. Anviniadin, vielä sen verran palaan Anviniadin, että hänen, hänen suuri arkistonsa siirtyi minulle aikoinaan myös valokuvat ja tota, siellä arkistoissa on myös monia muita rotuja kuin, kuin vain tiipi Mutta meistä ei ole kysymys, tarkoitan minusta, vaan kysymys on Julietestä. Hän on hän on tehnyt muun muassa 54 koirakirjaa ja nykyisin asuu Nepalissa, niin kuin varmaan hyvin tiedätte, Britti, joka asuu Nepalissa, hänen puolisonsa on mukana täällä tänään ja he ovat olleet hyvin tiipetiläisissä tunnelmissa tämän viikonlopun ajan. Jatkavat huomenna sitten tosiaan tuonne Eestiin. Tämä äh, harrastuksen ja koirien Koirat yhdistävät ihmisiä ja, ja niin tässä tapahtui muutama oikea ihminen, muutama soitto tai viesti. Itse asiassa Anukka Paloheimo ja Eija Wienlander, jotka ovat voimanaisia siellä on, on, omilla alueillaan niin, ja verkostoituneita kovasti, niin tämän oli hirmu helppo ruveta järjestämään. Tämä oli, kun he, he tätä rupesivat puhumaan ja puhumaan tökkinään vähän, niin Saatiin tällainen tapahtuma muun muassa aikaan. Kiitos teille kovasti. Um, of course we are very, very happy that we, we had you and your experience you are sharing to us this night. Enjoy your event here and I hope you have been enjoying in Finland already. You have been here a few days. Yeah. So before before stage is yours, do you like to say yeah. some words? Viihtykää ja nauttikaa. Ja oikein hyvää koiravuotta meille kaikille. Kiitos. Kiitos teille kaikille, kun tähän iltaan. Ja mä... Haluaisin painottaa sitä, että Jounin apu on ollut ihan merkitsevä ja, ja sehän lähtee siitä, että on intohimo asiaan. Ja se meidän intohimo asiaan on, on koirat ja tiipytiläiset rodut erityisesti, uh, mutta myös niin kun, uh, se, että halutaan auttaa, niin, niin, niin meillä on, meillä on tuommoinen myynti, myyntipöytä sitten, missä, millä, tuo, millä ne kaikki, mitä eurot me saadaan, niin sillä tuetaan. Juliettin ja Diipian koulusäätiötä, joka kouluttaa nuoria, nuoria niin kuin saamaan suuntaa ja, ja taitoa selviytyä tässä. tässä, tässä tota. ja, ja mä toivon, että tota, kun tämä tilaisuus loppuu, niin te, teidän sydämessä on pieni, pieni uusi pala Tiibettiä. Ja, ja, ja mä oon siellä ollut yhden kerran äh, viisi vuotta sitten ja, 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 ja hinku on kova tästä takaisin. Hienoja rotuja, hienoja ihmisiä, hieno, hieno maa. Tervetuloa. Welcome Juliet. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So we suddenly had a, a, I had a big fear here that the screen went black and I could get it back on. <laughs> Um, right, um, so I've been asked to speak loudly because the microphone isn't doing its thing, so I hope I don't deafen you, but I, I can speak loudly, I just hope I'm speaking loud enough for that, and if I suddenly fade off, please tell me and I'll try and boost my voice. Um, first of all, my thanks to Yoni and to all of you for coming, um, and also especially to Anuka for having organised all this, it was her idea and i think it's worked out perfectly it's a, it's a, it gives me a bigger perspective of the the, the show world or the, the, the tibetan breeds world at least in 
Finland. So it's been a very, very interesting number of days for me. Um, and I think it's, it's probably, yeah, I've talked more than once in a week, I know, but, but it's the only time I've been abroad and actually judged two dog shows and given two talks. Um, so that, that's really special for me. Um, I always talk without notes and I often go off with tangents. Um, so if I go off track or if I'm taking too long, Yoni or Anuka, please tell me, speed up. Um, <laughs> And we've done the lights off. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just locked the door. No, 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 I'm go. um, but what I, I thought, he only says we have sort of almost an hour and a half now left, um, is I've, I've sort of split the pictures. I won't say it's the talk because I haven't fixed the talk. I'm just going to speak as the pictures come up. But <laughs> I've, I've fixed the pictures into little sections about <clears throat> Tibet or whatever. So I think after every little section, I'll ask you if you have any questions about that section, because it might be about one of the breeds or Tibet or the charity or whatever. And Anuka has asked me especially to put stuff in about the charities as well. Um, what I probably should explain very briefly is that, and, and do you all speak English and understand English? Yes. Good. Um, that's a rude question to have been, I'm sure. Um, but I have now lived in Nepal for nearly 15 years next month. Um, and I began, this has nothing to do with this at all, but I began in Afghan hands. I had my first one in 1976. Obviously, I'd had um, a dog as a child, but then I was in, had a professional life and working like crazy and whatever. So it wasn't until 1970, I was working, lived abroad and worked abroad. Um, it was 1976, I came back, I'd just come back to England, had an Afghan, two Afghan hounds, only two, didn't prove them. And then in 1979, um, I wanted another long-coated breed. And I had a friend with Shih Tzu, um, and I just love Daryl's Felicity, you may, might not be a... Mm -hmm. yeah. that you're familiar yeah. with, but, um, the, the owner of Daryl's Dorothy Gurney, um, you know Daryl. Yes, good, she good. has also written a book. Sorry? Also. She has also written a book of six to Dorothy. That's yes. right, Dorothy and Stan. And, and they had Afghans, but they also, we knew them from Afghans. Okay. Loved their Shih Tzu, and we were really deliberating about whether we would have a Shih Tzu. And then I saw John Ford's Apsos, and I fell in love with them, that's John Tus. And the only thing that decided me against the Shih Tzu and for the last Apso in those early days was that Dorothy convinced me that I couldn't do the top knot correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so really that's how I ended up with absolutely not shit through. Uh, I've never been a good hairdresser. Maybe. I've never done anything, domestic or whatever. But she said, you'll never do the shit, you never do the top knot up like that. And and that really, so from then we sort of swayed towards absolute. And I had Absence from 1979. I think it was 84 when I made it my first champion. But I mean, it, at that time in England, there were so many dogs in the ring. I remember even with Afghans, the biggest number of dogs in the ring in one class that I was in was 64, yeah. which I think was postgraduate dog. I mean, there were phenomenal numbers then. And the same, thank you. <laughs> um, the same with. Um, the Apsos, you know, it, it, it was in England. I'm going off at a tangent before I've even started. Yes. But <laughs> because the breed, in my personal opinion, in England was stronger, both numerically and in some ways physically then, and truer to type then than it is now. It's very mixed now. Um, like we had. Um, Champion Saxon Spoons Fresno, who was the top winning bitch. And I mean, she was the top winning bitch for so, 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 so long. And in fact, the year our bitch was made up, she was the only other bitch made up that year. And now, and I know this is going live and it might be heard by other people, but it's easier to win well with a dog than it was then. Then it was extremely difficult to win with a dog. Um, 
So end of that horrible story. But anyway, so I've, I've never had Tibetan masters. I've never had Tibetan terriers. I've never had Tibetan Simons. Uh, never had Shih Tzu. But I've, since my interest, I've always been, my interest in Tibetan breeds, it's always been broad spectrum. It's not just Apsos. It, it, I love all the breeds, and I can recognize the, the merits of all the breeds, yeah? So to begin with, let's start, and I think I can just do this by touching, so I gather, um, a taste of, has that happened? Yes. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Good. So I'm not going to look that. I'm going to look there. Um, a taste of Tibet. Oh, this, I mean, I, I've only put a few pictures in, but this, oh, the picture on your left, um, that is Everest, and I've flown over Everest or by Everest mm. many times, really. Um, but I think we all have to realise that all of our dogs from the Tibetan, of the Tibetan breeds, come from this incredibly difficult climate, where obviously they're not going to be high up like that. Um, but you've got incredibly bright light, and you've got um, the snows as well. So where, like in the Apsos, we're not talking about Apsos yet, but the head fall over the Apsos, those of you who are in the breed probably know they've got long eyelashes and the head fall comes over the eye. Well, in our British standard, we've changed things because they said, oh, the head fall over the eye can damage the eyes, blah, blah, blah. The reason they've got a head fall over the eyes is uh, to, to protect against the glare of the sun and the glare of the snow. So there are reasons wider standards were made the way they were made, but the Kennel Club has chosen to change them. Um, right, sorry, what do I do next? So, um, I, this is not the truck I went in, but I did go overland to Tibet and I was in a lorry for a large part of the journey. I was there, I've only been in once, and that was in 2000. Um, and in fact, I went on my 50th birthday. I set off the eve of my 50th birthday. So we're talking mm -hmm. now 24 years on because it was my birthday the other day. And nothing to do with dogs again, but I treated myself to a meal, to a steak, which you can't really eat in Nepal or shouldn't eat in Nepal. And I broke a tooth the night before I set off. So I was away for about 10 days, but I spent the five days in Lhasa looking around for dentists in case I needed one. <laughs> it lasted until I got home and the vet, not the vet, I don't know. <laughs> the dentist said, you know, well, thank goodness, because you were just so lucky it didn't, it didn't actually start really hurting, um, but whatever. So that was my experience. But this is how the people travel overland into Tibet. I went overland from Kathmandu and it's very, very different from flying in and flying out because you have to go over a much higher altitude before you go down into the Lhasa Valley. Um, but the dogs are mainly in the valleys rather than at these high altitudes. Yes. So that was the little one I was in a large part of the time. Part of the time I was in a little mini van bus or something like that, um, but um, it kept breaking down, so and it, it was a disaster with the Chinese and the Tibetans and what have you. And this, yes. uh, this is just to show you that it's a very barren country and you've got lots and lots of flatness and coldness um, and then you've suddenly got the mountains. I mean, it's not a hospitable <laughs> terrain, anything that I saw of it wasn't. And here you can see I was going over, I think it was 5,200 and something meters, but you've got to get up over that before you get down into the valley, which is 3,000 something. Um, but I mean, I did get, I did get altitude sickness, um, which I probably, I probably speak more freely than I should do even in public, but we all got off our truck to have a pee. The men went one side and the ladies went the other. And I went, I remember very vividly, left, had a pee in the snow. And then I turned around, I could see the, I could see the, the truck that I got to get to. And I just couldn't get there. You know, I literally was, and, and I just, and it wasn't the, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a truck by then, it was a bus by then. 
and there was a professor of something who was Greek on the same bus, and he just sat over me. So we're going down now, Julia. We're going down. We're going down. And I think I was at about four eight when that happened. But by the time we went down to Tingri, which was the town that we were stopping in for the night, I was perfectly all right. So the going down, I don't know how long it took because I wasn't really with it. But from then on, I was perfectly all right, and I could go up over the 5,000. But what had happened, I think, is that we had, um, because of truck breakdowns and all sorts of things, we'd, gone, we'd stayed a day lower than we should have done. So we'd gone up a little bit too far. So if any of you ever go into Tibet and go overland, make sure you give yourself plenty of time because you do have to apply the time. Um, um, I'm doing this right. I am oh, never been out of mouse. Sorry. How can I bring that down? Sorry, I've been really in a second. Next to the south, see her note of the line at Nakush, right? This is the one I'm after. You've got it. Oh, no. <coughs> sorry. Oh, we've got miles now. I'm sorry. This is the one you want. Yeah, you've got the back end of the terrier. Um, so, this was the only Tibetan terrier I saw in Lhasa. And those of you who were there, who were there on the previous talk, um, may have seen that, um, but it's the only one that I ever saw, and the, it wasn't the only one I saw, but the only one I saw in Lhasa. Um, but the problem then, and I'm sure it's the same now from what I've heard from people, because living in Nepal, I meet quite a lot of tourists, we've got a small hotel there, who come in and they've been into Tibet and they tell me what it's like. Um, but the Tibetans are very worried, or they were when I was there, very worried like this man, I wanted to talk to him, I wanted to see the dog straight across the road, because they're frightened of who I'm going to tell. They don't really trust anyone, and then the Chinese might take the dog off them. Um, so that was the only one I saw there, but I did, and again, I'm repeating myself from the other day. Am I speaking loud enough? Can you hear at the back? Yeah. Um, the uh, only other one I saw was actually herding sheep, um, but the driver wouldn't stop to let me take any photos because I stopped him too often. Um, but it was definitely herding the sheep. It could have been goats because my, I was focused on the dog, but it was definitely a, a creamy, whitey Tibetan terrier. There was no question of that, and it was working. Um, so... Yes. So I've got to get that down for the next few, sorry. Oh, you're seeing me mm -hmm. that as well. Sorry, I won't move it on. Have I missed something? I have missed something here. I missed the app so somehow. Yeah, there, there's um, there. Yeah, that's the, again, in, in Tibet, that was the, I did see two or three apps, maybe, but that was the only one I got close enough to photograph properly. And that was circumambulating the um, Potala, no, the Jokan temple. Um, so they just go round and round and round. Yeah, I don't know how I missed him. Right, and I think this is the last I'm a bit worried because the next one is a blank. Why did I use blank? Um, <laughs> this is the last of the pictures in Tibet, um, which was outside the Tashi Lumpur Monastery. Um, and for me, I'm very worried about these blanks coming up in a minute. Um, for me, the Tibetan Mastiff, I took a picture, I didn't put it on here, of the paw. And I'm thinking, well, 
how far is that dog walked? Because when we were on the way to Lhasa, some Tibetan mastiffs and people came over running what seemed like miles away down to see us, you know, just to see people on the road. <coughs> and you think, oh God, what a life and what conditions do they actually operate in? I'm just, I'm just going to be really rude and just, I don't know why. So roll, roll down if you have just added there some blank slides. Just roll down if they are there. No, mm -hmm. all blank. Oh, sorry. And let me just click on the blank and see what it happens. It was funny because those, those pictures seem to come out of water. Yeah, I just don't see how that could have happened. Why is the education stop and there's a bit on of those? Uh, you have another one? Maybe it's on another one? I can't delete it. They have it. You would have seen if I was deleting from it. Should I help you? Should I help you? I'm from IT. Should I help you? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it works with me for people. Yeah. Which I'm using with I've got the um, the pen drive. The pen drive. Yeah. The two pen drives. So oh, like, here. This is something else. That's, oh, no. that's certainly not me about food. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give your pen back? Would yeah, you? That, that, yeah. Because now we don't see any. No, there's no, nothing no, at all. Start, oh, not even much. the stars gone now. No. <laughs> And this is all on the browser, so maybe there is an issue with the internet connection. It's not the... No. There is a third one. Is this yours? Or? No, no, this is... Yeah. 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 Yes, <laughs> sometimes it's good. Yes. It's yes. A -A -A yes, yes, yes. You have your own IP support. That is good. I've also got it on my phone. Mm -hmm. <coughs> a A A Finman, that's the one. And it's the Tibetan Village Please. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So it seems there is a small technical issue is reading the file. I don't want it to begin with. Yes, yes. Let's see. Um, Shall I leave it to come to when I talk to the audience? Yes, please. Would that be sensible? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you don't. There's nothing I can do. No, <laughs> I'm I'm lost. Uh, so while we have a slight pause, hopefully it's only slight, um, bear in mind I've also got it on my phone in PowerPoint, but that's probably the same problem. I've got it in my phone, he's got it on another lap, another. Okay, maybe we can actually connect your phone to the computer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can put these two on. I, I mean, I'm no good with it, but I can do it. Just put these two things back. It's on. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Oh, 
Let's see. We have some other photos. Do you want me to stay here? I can can you open other one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. yes, yes. We, we ended up with this man here, didn't we? Yes. So yes. let's end up with this man here. Yeah? And let me just <laughs> put that in my pocket. Um, yeah, before we move on to the next little bit, um, does anybody have any questions at all about what little I know of Tibet? Um, I want to explain that I have a lot to do with the Tibetan community in Nepal, because anybody who wants to live like a Tibetan as opposed to under Chinese dominance has to live outside the country. Um, so there are big Tibetan communities in Nepal, which I'm very, very associated with, and there they can speak freely. Um, but any questions before moving on, or no, no questions. No. Okay, here I am. Next one. Right. So confusion oh, about. Many, no, Sorry. <laughs> All good. So confusion about. So we can go on to the first picture. Next, next one down, sorry. Yeah, try. Because what I was doing, there, I was doing the wrong thing. I was just pressing. Oh, because it was before. No, it's not. It's not working. Before. Because I found out that I was Right, okay. Okay. So here, you, the, there was, the breeds were in a real, real mess originally. Something that annoys me, and still annoys me terribly, is that people say that the Lhasa Apso first came to England in 1924, which in fact is totally untrue. Um, the, the problem is, oh, well, I'm all right standing at the moment, but if, if I can, I've got access to the city if I need to. Um, is that firm? That's firm. Um, that the breeds, the, the APSO did actually first come into the country, according to Ronald, Colonel Ronald, Ronald Cardew Duncan, um, in 1854. Um, now, it's very difficult to sort of prove that thing, but what happened was that the Lhasa APSO came under many, many different names, and it was confused with the Tibetan Terrier. It was large and small. But I mean, here, these, this is a museum in Tring. That there's the one on the right and the one in the middle are both called Tibetan Terriers, but in fact, they were both Apsos. Uh, the one on the your right, uh, Rapso, he was actually the first Tibetan, sorry, the first Lhasa Apso champion, and he measured 10 inches at the shoulder. He's obviously rather long in mm -hmm. foreface. So there were Tibetan Terrier traits, but actually, he was an APSO, and the APSO claim him, and the Tibetan Terrier people don't, as their first champion. Um, and the one on the left here was, I think it was just called the Tibetan Dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tibetan Dog, which presumably was a Tibetan Spaniel. Um, so we have the next one. Yeah. And here, um, so this was taken, I think, in 1931. 31, yeah. um, and it is believed to be uh, the show of which, um, which one was it? Um, no, I'm not just putting it differently here. But it, it was showing, the, the reason the picture is up for you, not the Tibetan Terrier people, was that it was, it was where a Tibetan Terrier got its third, fourth CC, we think. Um, but it shows how you've got all the different breeds together. And in those early 30s, all the dogs had sort of come in, but nobody really knew quite what breeds they were. And they were judged together. Wait, which country was this in? Sorry, this picture was taken in India. This was okay, where Dr. India. Green yeah. um, made up um, 
Mr. I think it was Mr. No, it was Mr. Binks. It was Bunty, I think, um, that she made up at this show. We think this is that picture from 1931. Um, okay. Yeah, and you can see here this. This was published. If any of you have got. Hutchinson's Dog Encyclopedia. It came in two volumes. It was published in 1933 and 1934. Um, and this picture was one of the last APSO pictures. And I've been to seminars with fairly renowned APSO uh, judges, or you know, and they've sort of said, oh, you know, look what the what the last APSO looked like in 1934. It was so typical, blah, blah, blah. And in fact, Apart from the dog on your left, that one, right. that side, my, Mrs. Wild, Miss Wilde, Margaret Wilde, um, Marjorie Wilde, um, that is an so but all the rest are actually Shih Tzu. And um, we can actually, we do know, I, I haven't got them on the top of my head, oh, got them. Yeah, Lady Brownrig, I, I, I can, if I look at home, and I'm not at home, but I can give you the names of all those dogs. They're definitely registered Tibetan, sorry, registered Shih Tzu. And it was Miss Wilde on the end with one apso. Um, and they were all in the same class, all called Lhasa Apsos. Mm. And then Tibetan Dogs at Richmond Championship Show. Again, this is 1934 now. Um, but th that is Harding Cox that's judging. But again, you can see there are different dogs there, probably primarily Tibetan Terriers, mm. but again, it was mixed, it was really mixed, and it was just Tibetan dogs being shown. Right, so that's the end of the confused bit, but I will continue into the confused bit with each of the individual breeds. Shall I just carry on? Yeah. 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 Right, so the app, so here, I mentioned earlier, the next one, here, um, that Ronald Cardi Duncan, who went into Tibet and Nepal, um, he came back and he wrote a book in 1950, he came back in 1955 and he wrote a book in 1956. And he brought Tom Wu from Tibet, a Tibetan terrier, back and he brought um, other, uh, a Tibetan Mastiff back. Um, and he said, and I have no really, I don't know why he said it, but he, in his opinion, the APSO first came in, the last APSO first came into England in 1854. Now, this picture, which hangs in the Kennel Club Library, was in 1855. Now, to me, the dog is second from the, this one here, second on the table, looks like a last APSO. Uh, Elizabeth Luck who is an APSO person in New Zealand, she says, oh, no, 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 it's a, it's a uh, Yorkshire Terrier. Now, she might be right, and I can't prove that I'm right at all, but it ties in with the dates. If Duncan thought that something came in in, 19, in 1854, and this to me looks like an APSO at Jemmy Shaw's Canine mm -hmm. Meeting, yeah. which was one of the first, well, the first, they call it the first dog show as such, um, in 1855, it's very likely, I think, that that may have been the same dog, yeah? Um, and here, this is India, but registered as a Bhutia Terrier. And this is where the confusion has come, mm -hmm. come in with the names, because um, the Bhutia Terrier was clearly Alas, Apsa, there was no question about it. And when I have, when I was researching my first book about the last Apsa, um, I went very, very thoroughly through all the really early pedigrees. And very often, even in one litter, there might be three or four different breed names. There could be uh, Russian Poodle, Brutia Terrier, um, the word Lhasa Apso probably didn't came, come in then, but Apso from Tibet or whatever. So there were lots of Maltese poodle, they used to call them sometimes. So lots of different names, even within the same pedigree. But there was a particular lady, um, McLaren Morrison, or Honorable Mrs. McLaren Morrison, who brought a lot of the foreign breeds in, especially the Asiatics. Um, and 
Miss Wilde, who I didn't know, but I've got all her cuttings, and I think you'll see some of her cuttings. I've taken pictures from her cutting books for you. Um, but I, I, I've been very lucky all through my life in dogs, really, that I've been very much involved with the old people. Now I'm one of the old people. Here, but, <laughs> um, but when they die, they sort of left things, even people I haven't met, they've left things to the sort of next old people coming along. <laughs> Those old people before they died. Oh, Julia, you know, you must have Miss Wilde's cutting book, or you must have this, that, and the other. So I've got lots of old papers. I've got even, and we haven't discussed it yet, and I can't remember what I've put on here, but uh, I've got all the correspondence when in England we had the, in 1934, the Tibetan Breeds Association was formed, and I've got all the wonderful correspondence from all these wonderful people. I mean, it's it, you can sort of sit down and you just relive the whole thing. It's, it's just wonderful. So, and that's all in Nepal, which isn't much use to anybody up there. Um, right, and this is Tuko. Uh, this was a, an APSO from 1904. So, and th they did vary, very, very much in substance and type and head shape as well. And, and this is from Miss Wilde's book. And what is so has been so important for me is that the old ladies, as I knew them then, they really bothered about their breeds. I mean, now everything is so digital, um, really, really digital. But these people, they cut their cuttings out and they stuck them on, as you can see, with sellotape, which has aged. She wrote her notes about uh, some of them, oh, this looks like my sona, this looks like my satru. Um, they're really, really bothered. And the, Lady Frieda Valentine, who became a very good friend of mine in her latter years, she, you know, she had the same thing. They all had these wonderful little cuttings books and photograph albums. And, and this one, uh, sorry, Miss, can we just go back to that one? But yeah, was it eight, 18 years? Yeah. Um, this was Lhasa. Uh, it was actually called Lhasa. That was its name, its registered name. But it lived till it was 18 years old. Now, this take picture was taken in 1906. So it must have been born, I can't remember when, on the top of my head, but it was born in the previous century. Um, and I think it's beautiful. Um, and it's so different from what we see today. Right, and this is Duma. Yeah. Um, again, the, the Rothschild Museum is, is the first picture you saw when we talked about the confusion, showed um, the dogs in the Rothschild Museum. Um, this is Duma, and that was 1908, was it 1908? Yeah, came from Calcutta and came back into the UK. Um, but the Rothschild Museum, I mean, the, I think the, the taxidermy in its day was not necessary, you know, it was probably stuffed a bit more than it was difficult. To, it may not have looked exactly like that in real life, I think. But it, the, the Rothschild Museum is just a wonderful place. <coughs> it was started um, by the Rothschild family, but um, the dogs were introduced later, not by Rothschild himself. But there's a, a lovely collection of dogs there. It's not in London, it's outside London, but it's get out of all. You know, it's a few hours drive, two hours drive maybe from London. And here we're back in Miss Wilde's album again. Um, and you can see that these are the first two Lhasa Rapso champions. You've got Rapso, which is the, the back to front here, but the, the, this one and this one and this one is up, so, and the one down this side, bottom left, um, is little Darji that got a champion later on. But so there were absolutely, how can the Kennel Club, the UK Kennel Club, say when it speaks at Crops and the group comes in and says, this is the last episode that first came to England in 1924, but we've actually got them here from 1908. Um, and that, that, that just infuriates me, and I've told them a million times, and they've got my books in the library, uh, but they don't read them. <laughs> so, and I'm not knocking the kettle club, I am a kennel club member myself, but I just wish people would do their homework properly. Um, and again, this is Rapso again, you saw him, you've seen him a couple of times. Do you have any idea what size he was? 
He was 10 inches of shoulder. Ten exactly inches. 10 inches yeah. of shoulder. Great. Yeah. So he definitely, although yeah. his head looks more Tibetan terrier yes. he was very, yeah. very low to the ground. Well, absolute low. And here you've got Colonel Bailey. Now this is um, Colonel Bla Bailey that came into, he was with the young, hus hu the young husband expedition to Gyantsi in Tibet in 1903 and 1904. So he'd been traveling into Tibet since then and then was back again in the 20s. And he brought Apsos back here. Um, this I put in, I don't know about the actual age of this, but it's the ninth, uh, because I don't know how old the man looks, I've, I've looked, but he died in 1937. So I would say this was probably about 1920s at some point. Um, and these, which I've only just found this very recently, two apsos behind him. And the Panchen Lama, of course, is the one that now the Chinese have taken over the Panchen Lama. Mm -hmm. um, and these were some of Mrs. Bailey's dogs that came in. Um, these are the five that originally came in, I think. Um, so she brought them in from Tibet. And this is probably worth saying that at that time, um, the color preferred was golden. Um, but she had brought hers in and they were golden. So obviously, she, I mean, I didn't meet Mrs. Bailey, but she was obviously going to say golden was the preferred color because that's what she'd got and that's what she brought in. <laughs> um, but I do know now that white is actually the preferred color for Lhasa Apsos. And you can get pure white Apsos in the Himalayan regions. In England, there was only one pure white export, uh, import rather, to England, and it never bred on. So the, the, to my mind, that is, ne to my knowledge, there's never been a pure white Apso in the UK. People say, oh, my dog is white. But if you look closely, the dog is not white. It's genetically cream. Yeah. Um, but there the definitely are white ones in uh, Nepal. But often the pigment is poor. I'm not saying they're albinos, but they have poor pigment usually. Um, oh, yes, well, to, to finish that, you can say on that. But what Mrs. Bailey said was about gold. Um, and then um, gold. That's how much I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 the golds are um, the preferred colour. But the abso, the abso people, the Tibetan people, sorry, like that. Their ideal colour is white, and it's white because it is the, the colour of the snow lion. Um, and the snow lion, of course, is mm. the symbol of Tibet. It's on the flag. We have one, one painting there. We have there. one there. Yeah. That's right. If you want to see yeah. a snow lion, it's there. Um, and the Tibetans like the color white because it is the color of the snow lion. And what Mrs. Bailey said, and this is how it's, things get misconstrued, that Golden was the preferred color because it was the color of a lion. Well, in fact, it's not the lion. There are no lions mm. in Tibet. It's the snow lion, which is a mythological creature. Mm. So everything, yeah, unless you yeah. actually look behind, you can see why mm. she'd understood lion-like colors are preferred, golden mm. is preferred, mm. but it, it's not the lion. And the Tibetans wouldn't have known even what a lion yeah. was, probably. They know the snow lion. So that, that's yeah. uh, And the second choice of color in Tibet is actually black. And they like a little bit of white on it. Um, so here we've got tactroandroma that Mrs. Dudley had in the UK in 1934. And again, these are, to me, nice typical yeah. specimens of the yeah. breed. I mean, then you didn't have you didn't have the grooming equipment, obviously. And I remember, I'm jumping backwards and forwards, but I remember in, I first went to Nepal in the, in 91, and I remember I went into a house, nothing to do with dogs, but I went into a house with a boy or young man that sort of said, oh, come into my house. And, um, uh, come into my house, and he, he just sort of stood in front of a wall, 
and he very proudly took down a plastic comb. And it's the sort of plastic comb that in England we would have paid tenpence for at the time. And that really was the only kind of comb that they got. And he combed his hair with it just to prove to me that he got a comb. Mm. Well, if, if that's all you can have to comb your own hair with, what can you do to keep the dog's coats in good condition? Mm. You just can't. It's different now. Um, but if the coats are of the correct quality, mm. you can manage them. They can manage them. They can clip them off or whatever, and they'll grow all right. But if they are of the wrong quality, then they're not going to be a functional coat. And that is important for me. The forward, yeah. Back to Miss Wilde's book again. Um, I just like this picture. It's Satru, Masona, and Satru, that way around. Um, and it, I, what, I, what I particularly love about this picture is that this is like a on the picture. Oh, you can just see it. But the dog crate, and it always made me think, well, we do it, or I, we did it when I was in England. You keep your handbag in the dog crate, and they kept their handbag <laughs> in the dog crate. <laughs> <laughs> That was my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we move on here with access to 52. And you can see this is um, Zaramba Fursyhurst. So it was best of breed at Crufts in 52. Now it's not, maybe if its tail were up, mm -hmm. it would look more like an Apso. Mm -hmm. But you again, you can no, see the long full yeah. face there. And not everybody seems to know that Tenzing Norgay had Lhasa Apsos and actually went to Crufts. Tenzing Norgay was the man who first climbed Everest with Sir Edmund Hillary, um, but he did have Apsos and bred them and came to England and actually went to Crufts one year. And this was the first post-war UK champion, uh, Gunga de Nevers, who probably is in a lot of our pedigrees. Um, here, these are just some of the sort of greats in Las Apsos. Uh, Cheska Alexander of Sternrock, mm. who won, he was the first Apso to win a group at Crafts. And he was co-owned by Frankie Sefton, who's now died. She was, a, she, but she was in England and she then moved to Australia. Um, and Pamela Stone. Um, Champion Sack and Springs Hack and Sack. Um, he won Best in Show at Crafts in 19, eyesight, 1984. Um, and he was the son of Intrepid. And Intrepid was made up in the, I don't know which way around it was. He came from, Amer he was, came from America, he was all lanes, then came from America, England, was made up in England, then went back to America, got made up in America, and then came back to England again. But the sun, I personally think, was superior. And here, Fresno. Now, to me, she was the real record holder of the breed. Um, um, Jean Bly bred some very lovely stock. She had some things that I wasn't so keen on, but some of her earlier stock was lovely. And this. Uh, I've put this on here so that you can see that the, it's six generations of champions. You've got Verl's Tom True, which is top left, um, Hardegger Hitchcock, top right. Then you've got the American and English champion, Malcolm. I, I didn't know Hitchcock and I didn't know Tom True. And then Salt and Pepper, who I absolutely adored and I used. But that was an interesting one. I used him because. I loved him so much, and he did tie in to a certain extent with my breeding because I, um, sorry, going backwards, but Tabby at the bottom on the right, yeah, right, is mine. Um, and her father was Charlie Farley, who was a son of um, Salt and Pepper. So we got that line, and I went back to um, Salt and Pepper. And it just, it absolutely didn't work. I got short tails. I mean, they were all, they were all right, but two of the litter of puppies had a very short tail. And it just seemed odd to me that 
everything should have been perfect and it, it wasn't quite. And we didn't show, well, I did, I did show one from that letter, but then she knocked the teeth out when she was 18 months. So that, that was the end, totally. Um, right. And then what else have we got next? Um, and then that was Zentara Elizabeth, who won the second of the absolutes, who won Best in Show in 2012. And that, I should have mentioned to you, that was the only picture I could find of Elizabeth, but it happens to be on the front of, I've got, an e I've got a few e-books out that I've just fiddled about with and put online. But if, if you can get Kindle in Finland, which I suppose you can, um, I've got a few books on there of um, uh, kind of what I've done. Um, now, these... This picture is taken in um, Kathmandu, and I know personally three generations of this litter, all of which have been chocolate. I mean, maybe not all the puppies have been chocolate, but the ones I've seen are chocolate. And you can have chocolate liver genes in the last app, so, and also in the Tibetan Terrier. And the Tibetan people don't see anything wrong with it at all. Now, again, we go back to the early brain standards of 1934, um, and that was when the brain standards were made, and black no, you know, nose must be black. With a black nose, you absolutely can't have a liver or a chocolate. Mm -hmm. The Tibetans see nothing wrong in it, um, really genuinely see nothing wrong in it. Mm -hmm. And this was just an episode that I particularly liked in Bowden, when was that, 96. Mm -hmm. um, there were some lovely episodes in Nepal in the 90s. Um, but as time has gone on, they've not really, they're, they're not coming out from Tibet anymore into, Nepal, into Nepal. They sort of been here. And often I've said to people, you know, well, what happens when a bitch comes into season? And they say, oh, well, we send it away i don't know where they send it away to and then it comes back and i think sometimes it's mated by something not quite last at so or whatever it should be and this was in dharamsala this was it would have been in the 80s mm -hmm. yeah um and this was on a table it was just a little white app so with a few puppies sitting on a table in somebody's house but again you know that one it looks bad because the hair is all in a terrible mess. But if it were in a better condition, it probably would be quite, you know, I don't know. It, might, it would probably be very fine, but it would be quite nice. And those are the three that I took with me over to Nepal of my own. Um, I got, when I left England, I got four apps that were still alive. And you plan for so long to go somewhere because we decided that I would move years before um, and we I'd never had an app so live more than 16 years all but a week which was Nick um, and sure enough in June of the year before I was moving in 2009 um, Millie turned 16 <laughs> and she was still alive when I left but she was too old to fly so I left her at home and that was horrible but those three came with me Um, and I put that there because this is an important point on the, the balance of the last app. So, and I touched on it at the Tibetan Terrier seminar as well. And I shan't say who, but a speaker who was quite highly renowned on the APSO got confused between, and as a speaker, got between confused between the withers and the point of shoulder. So I've got nothing to point with, but the point of shoulder is this foremost point of shoulder at the front of the dog's shoulder, if that's the dog, front of the shoulder, and the withers is the top. Now, because she had said that the dog must be longer, the abso must be longer from withers to point of buttock, when she should have said from point of shoulder to point of buttock, we actually got a lot for, for maybe 10 years a lot of very long what looked like low actors and it was because this person I, I i think it was because this person had really given misinformation 
to her audiences and people listen. Um, and then when we sort of, I don't know, at some point, some of us started having the confidence to speak out and say, you know, well, I'm sorry, but that's not the point of shoulder. That's the point of shoulder, vice versa. Um, then we seem to see this difference in shape. But we did have this, this uh, it must have been about 10 years, a lot of dogs were very, very long. Um, so I've just ended on the app so bit with pictures of, do I mean, I, I haven't done too much about each particular breed, but um, also I've ne I never judged him. He was the sire of my um, kitty that I brought over to. Nepal, but I think had a lovely outline and a beautiful coat texture. And he went group four in the utility group at Crafts when he was there. Um, and then, and here, this is something that I noticed, um, well, not noticed, but I know it happens. In, in FCI countries, well, I believe, or certainly at breed shows, you, give a, you can give a best in show and the reserve best in show is the best opposite sex. Mm -hmm. Well, in England, it needn't be that way. The reserve best in show can be the second best of whatever sex one first. So you, you give your best in show, and not if you don't want to, but if you want to, you can bring in the reserve bitch ticket or reserve dog ticket. And this was a breed show that I judged. I think it was the last breed show I judged. Um, and I made best in show the black one, and I made reserve best in show the black and white one which was actually the reserve bitch ticket. So best in show and reserve best in show went to the top two bitches. But that, I think, can't happen here. It's, it's safer because it's all out and out war if it happens. <laughs> <laughs> it can be. Right, so any questions about the Shih Tzu? Sorry, the Apso before we move on to the Shih Tzu. I would have one. And can I sit down and answer yes. them just for two minutes? I would have a question regarding the cold, because uh, we take care of them and once a week we wash them and we brush them. But now I have the impression after you spoke that in Tibet they, they don't really have normally very long and very well. No. Okay, so they're just like, they what comes off them. Are they, are they really taking care? I had this picture in my mind always that. You know, there are monks sitting and, and brushing. <laughs> <laughs> but earlier on, in the pre in the 19, was it the 1934 standard, I think it was, you, it was actually written into the standard that you should see daylight beneath the coat, which, of course, even in an apps, well, even in Tibetan terrier, you occasionally don't see it. But apps is now, of course you don't see daylight beneath the coat, you know, you, you brush it. And no, no, the, I mean, you saw that picture of the ninth Panchen Lama, I mean, that was before I was born, well before I was born, I hope. Um, but I mean, they were just knotted, knotted, knotted. And you do get that. And what happens is that the, the, the people realize that when, as we all do, that when a dog's coat gets knotted, it's very difficult, it hurts it, mm -hmm. to clip it or groom it or do anything with it. And so often I've come across dogs and I've gone up to talk to them, oh, don't, don't, don't speak to it, angry dog, angry dog. Well, the reason it's angry is because it's in agony, because it's not so tightly minded skin. Um, but now it's a little bit better. They do groom, you know, they groom them to the best of their ability. And we can now get grooming equipment in to Nepal from China, um, but they, it's a different perception there. They don't, um, dog shows are a hundred years behind the West in Nepal. I mean, I think they developed a little bit in the 70s and 80s and then they've just fallen backwards. Um, sorry, so I was, can stand up again and I sat down for a second. Um, but the, the um, and again, I, I'm probably repeating myself, but I said to somebody, and I might have said to the last seminar, that um, I was judging a show once in, it was Kathmandu, and it was the last, uh, no, it wasn't, it was Popper, the la, the, but it was Nepal, the, the last APSO class, and there was only one entrance. So my steward said, you know, next class is the last APSO, so you have just one entry. And it was a, clearly a Tibetan terror, not a bad one. <laughs> and, and so we discussed it and spoke to the steward and spoke to everybody else. And we decided to change it in the class from 
last episode to become a Tibetan terrier. So that dog in the show ring became a Tibetan terrier. <laughs> um, and it, it, it was quite nice. Um, and then about two years later, it was a show I wasn't judging at, but I was invited to their chief guest to sit and look mm. at uh, whatever. I'm not, I'm not going into detail, but it was a disaster. Um, and outside the ring, before I left, um, somebody said, oh, we want you to see this last Apso, see this last Apso. And I saw it, it was a Tibetan terrier, and they said, yes, it's the son of the Lhasa Apso that was changed to a Tibetan terrier two years ago. And you just can't win, there's no winning with them at all. Um, and, and the, I'm going off at a tangent here, which I probably shouldn't, but before we move on to shift it, and it's not just that, but in Nepal, obviously the it's a different country. It's a very different country. And I've said it before, and I probably shouldn't say it again publicly, but it's true. But I, in the early stages, soon after I moved there, I did a particular week-long or five-night-long course. And I we talked about particular Tibetan breeds, but um, three hours on one breed in the morning, break for lunch, three hours in the afternoon. There were 38 people came to that particular thing. So for four days, we covered eight breeds. And now all these people are specialists in the breeds. You know, they've not even seen a good Shih Tzu. They've not seen a good Tibetan Terrier. Well, they might have seen a good Tibetan Terrier now. But, I think, you know, you spent years and years and years learning about your breed. And then these people just think they can do this. Um, and the Tibetan Mastiffs, are, are anybody here anything to do with Tibetan Mastiffs? No. No, but the Tibetan Mastiffs, I mean, it's a, it, it really is a problem because, again, in that I've got um, a lot of history of the Tibetan Mastiffs and a lot of books and things, um, that there are definitely at least three, but three main breeds in the Himalayan regions. You've got your Tibetan Mastiff, you've got your Bhutia, which is finer in bone, could even be slightly taller, slightly longer in foreface, narrower in skull, but it's a Bhutia, it's not a Tibetan Terrier. And you've got the Himalayan Black Dog, which is slightly finer again, less of them, uh, fewer of them. Um, but uh, now all the Tibetan Terrier people are saying that anything from the mountains is a Tibetan Terrier. Well, it's not, you know, they, and all oh, Himalayan, uh, what are they calling it? Tibetan Terrier, sorry, Tibetan, no, Bodhikukur, Bodhikukur? Yeah. Yeah, Bodhikukur, Tibetan Mastiff in brackets. But all Bodhikukur are not Tibetan Mastiffs. And that, it just annoys me. And I've had really nasty, nasty comments on Facebook from like somebody in his 20s saying, you know, well, you know, what do you know about Tibetan Mastiffs? You know, I've had them all my life. I've been brought up with Tibetan Mastiffs. But you're 22, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some of you probably remember, I know Yuni, Yoni, Yani, Yoni, Yoni does. And, um, and Winyard and, and I, because it, I'm sorry, I'm going off on Tibetan Mastiffs now. I'll be back in Shih Tzu in a minute. But the Tibetan Mastiffs in England were dying very early when they were six, seven, eight. It was very rare to get a, a Tibetan Mastiff above eight. And Anne and I together worked on, or, or it was mainly, she started the research and we went into it together, um, that they were getting too high a protein content. because, of, uh, And it's going to be the same with other breeds, Tibetan breeds to a certain extent. But because they were eating too much protein, when uh, still getting a bit personal, but when a, a Tibetan Mastiff goes to the toilet, the, given the size of the dog, the poo, the shit, the goo, or whatever you want to call it in Finnish, uh, is very small in proportion to what it's eaten because it utilizes everything in the body which it needs to do in Tibet. And it's not going to be given much, much protein to eat in Tibet, as presumably all the Tibetan breeds. And anyway, as a result, they ended up on a lower protein diet. And with a lower protein diet, 
they're living now to 13, 14, 15 even. Mm. Um, so and that is just that we really looked into the sort of mm. um, diet they were getting in their homeland, which was so different. Mm. And then we were talking, it was probably 90s by then, um, that you know, if it was high protein, you'd give it to your dog because it's better for it. But that's not always the case with last, with Tibetan breeds. Yeah. Well, I've gone off to real tangent. Mm -hmm. Should see. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Um, that is. I don't know the year of it, but but that was called a lion dog from an imperial dog book in China. Um, and as some of you. Hopefully, most of you know. I mean, not everybody agrees. Certainly, Mr. Rawlings didn't agree with me. But the 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 chances are very, very high that the way the Shih Tzu came about was because the Dalai Lama presented Lhasa Apso's to the Chinese um, ruling family, where they already had Pekingese, and they were crossed the eunuchs crossed the Apso with the Pekingese. So. I consider very clearly that a Shih Tzu is actually a Sino-Tibetan creation. It came out from China. It didn't come out from Tibet, but its ancestry came from Tibet. So certainly the Shih Tzu's ancestors were Apsos, but also Pekingese. Yeah. Um, and this, I think, is a nice one. Uh, because it, it's a, a, a scroll, but you can see the pug, which we have done, sorry, the pug at the top on the right, the Shih Tzu in the middle, and the peak at the bottom. Um, there, there's not that much difference between them in some ways, but that's an unusual one to see the three in one picture. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, and here, in 1929, this was in France, the Comtesse d'Anjou, um, and she was in China. Um, so to show that the Shih Tzu was in China and being shown in China in 29. Nothing more to say about that, really, except I don't know any more about it. Um, and then you've got the Brown Riggs dogs. Now, again, these were in Hutchinson's Dog Encyclopedia, listed as Lhasa Apsos, and they weren't. They were um, the um, Shih Tzu of Ms. Ms. Um, Brown, Mrs. Brownriggs. Um, and this was the Cheltenham show, or oh, oh, gone, but it was 33 or 34, 33, I think. Um, to go with you. Um, and again, um, Shih Tzu listed and publicized as Apsos in the 30s, early 30s, 33. And this was 34. But again, they appeared in the books of that day as Lhasa Apsos. I can't remember what I put in about this. It, it was called the War of the Noses, but I'll come to that in a moment, not now. Um, <laughs> And this is just to show you what some of the early Shih Tzu were like. And here they're in Olympia. That was before the World War. Now, I haven't put that much in, but what happened was that the you've got the Lhasa Apsos, the Tibetan, what we now know are Lhasa Apsos, Tibetan Terriers, Tibetan Mastiffs, obviously, and Tibetan Spaniels, and the Shih Tzu. Um, Tibetan Mastiffs were clearly different from the rest, so they really weren't one of the controversial things. Um, but they liked, and that was the reason I put that first picture in, they liked the name Lion Dog, and the Apso people considered their dog a Lion Dog, and the Shih Tzu people liked Lion Dog, so they wanted to call theirs a Lion Dog as well. <laughs> um, and I think at some point it actually had Lion Dog in brackets after it. Um, but you've got the Baileys with their Apsos, you've got um, the Brown Rings with the Shih Tzu, and these are all posh people, if I can put it that way. You know, they, they've got lots of money, they've got lots of power, and you know, what I say goes. Um, so what Mrs. Brownrigg said had to be true, and what Mrs. Bailey said 
had to be true. And then you've got Dr. Grieg. Are any of you Tibetan terrier people? You are. No, 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 you are. Right. Um, um, you've got, and you weren't there on that day, were you? But you've got Dr. Grieg, who was the first person to import Tibetan terriers into the UK. And she had been a doctor in Tibet, and her husband, sorry, her husband, a, a family had brought a woman with an ovarian cyst to be operated on. And they, the family came to the hospital with their animals, and the hospital said they couldn't keep them. So Dr. Grieg offered to keep the Tibetan terrier at her home while the woman was in hospital. Woman recovered, very grateful, and gave Dr. Grieg a puppy from her Tibetan terrier, which she then sent over to England. And according to Lady Frida Valentine, who was Apsos, she had um, Mrs. Bailey's Apsos, um, the, the meetings for the to try and divide the breeds, which took place in 1933 and 34, were held in Lady Frieda's house. Um, and she said, oh, she said, you know, they were so, so difficult, these people, so, so difficult, just, especially Dr. Greek, especially Dr. Greek. When she got angry, she wouldn't speak to anybody. And she said, so she said, what I used to do, she said, I used to put the cream, uh, it was I was made to put the cream cakes on the plate. And I would say, give them to Dr. Greek and make her take them round. Because if she takes the cream cakes round, she has to speak to people to say, would you like a cake? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and these, these things were just so wonderful. And she said, that was the only way to get her to speak to anybody. So I can just imagine. And then they'd go to the kennel club and they, they, they were all writing to the kennel club because it was general this and colonel that and they were all these big powerful people um so it, it was a, a very difficult time but they did sort things out in the end and what happened was the the it was decided that the noses of the shih tzu were shorter than the noses of the last absos um and it, it became called the war of the noses um, to decide which were Apsos and which were Shih Tzu. And, and Dr. Greek as well, when it came to Tibetan Spaniels, which you'll see in a moment, so we'll get there eventually. Um, but she she said, she got prickiered Tibetan Spaniels, and she said that these were correct. But they were correct because she got them, a bit like Mrs. Bailey said golden was the only colour for last Apsos, because that's what she got. Um, and here, this is so controversial on Facebook, and there's so much misinformation on Facebook. But this is a Shih Tzu, and it's called Choo Choo. And actually, my partner, Caroline Johnson, partner in dogs, blah, 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 um, used to photograph the Queen's dog. So you know, we used to go to Windsor Castle and photograph her dogs. And so we've had on very, very good authority, and met the Queen, obviously. Um, that Choo Choo was called Choo Choo. He's definitely a Shih Tzu um, because he made a, like a, tra a noise like a train. So they called him <laughs> Choo Choo. Um, but uh, the Apsu people suddenly again, I don't know why, but they were saying, oh, look at this wonderful, typical Apsu. But it wasn't an Apsu, it was a Shih Tzu for heaven's sake. And it came in from Norway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, it, it is a just, and this I think is the danger for me, and particularly with the AI thing now that's digital. You know, anything can be changed, and, and I, it frightens me that all this information that people, these old, these old ladies, these previously old ladies, that collected all this information so carefully and so accurately. And people are just walking all over mm. it and say, and I've noticed, I can't remember what it was. I was, it was with Tibetan Terriers, and I just wanted to double check on Daisy Greek because the three Greeks, there was Dr. Greek, her mother, and somebody called Daisy Greek on a picture. And I couldn't know who Daisy Greek is before I put this picture up. And Daisy Greek was the sister of the Dr. Greek. Um, I don't know why I'm saying this now. <laughs> but oh that's right yeah and i i just quickly googled and i thought oh, green blah, blah, blah. and it was quite a posh looking site but 
Ladcock was spelled Ladlock, and Daisy Greig was Dr. Daisy Greig, and she was Agnes. Um, you know, it just it takes nothing. It takes two minutes, and then somebody reads it and believes it, and that that's sad. And I think it's going to be sadder. Um, where are we next? One? Oh, and here, this is 1963. I've just put that up because that was Best in Shirt Wilkes. Now, you wouldn't win Best in Shirt Wilkes now looking like that. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath it was probably lovely. Um, and this was the first uh, champion shih tzu that Lady Brown Rake bred. I think that's probably out of sequence. It must be well out of sequence for some reason, sorry. Um, and again, this must have, I think this must have been before. Um, I've put this in purely because it's Nordic and it might mean something to you. Yeah, Böre Harsle. Sorry? Böre Harsle, Mecce Böre Harsle. Oh, well done. Good, yes. good, good, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, but it was, I only put it in because I found it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who it is, but something. Yeah, good. And this is a Shih Tzu that I found only earlier this year in February, the New Year Festival, in um, the Tibetan New Year Festival. And so I'm very involved with the Tibetan things here. And I've only ever seen one Shih Tzu in Nepal, which was in Kathmandu in the 90s. And obviously he died and his owner died. And this is the second one I've seen. Um, and it is the only Shih Tzu, certainly in Pokhara. There may be others in Nepal that I've not seen, but it was actually rather nice. But bought in from a pet shop. Um, I put that up just to show the uh, comparative shapes of the heads. Um, at the top, you've got the Shih Tzu, and then the last Apso on the far right there, and the Pekingese. So you can almost see how the Shih Tzu created the shape of head that it's got when you see the Apso head and the Pekingese head, which is flatter, and it's sort of got this happy medium in every respect. Maybe not. Maybe not. But well, yeah. <laughs> Um, again, I've just put a few pictures up of more recent dogs. Um, Easy Rider was one that did a lot of winning and was nice in England. Oh, Tamara Misery says, that's easy. not a particularly great picture of him. I actually gave him best of breed. Me um, too. <laughs> Me too. I loved him. You loved he was him. my yeah. best of breed. Also. Sorry? He was also my best of breed in the special. Really, really, yeah. yeah. He was I don't think that's dog. the greatest picture of him. No, I no. He, feel he was better than yes, that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the only one I could find. Um, I don't know who this is, but it was a junior, just to show you the, the junior. And this, I've never judged it, but I loved it. I absolutely adored this Shih Tzu that I saw. And that um, Santosha, Bert Easton, does anybody know Bert yeah. Easton? Yeah, that was one of his. And I just thought that was nice because you get the flowing movement there. And here, that was Luxembourg, my best of breed. I mean, I've just put it in because I found it. Um, <laughs> it doesn't it sound terrible. Um, and then what was this? This was Antwerp. Same man, for some reason. He must be the moustache. <laughs> and the Apso came third. I think second was a Tibetan master. For some reason, it wouldn't come into the hall. Um, and this, and I'm, it was only when I put these photos in here. That was when I judged in St. Petersburg in 2014. And if you look at probably the next photo, I think with a different hair color, she might be the same lady, I could be wrong, that I gave best in show to, best of breed to, at St. Petersburg in 2020. Yeah, yeah. I might be wrong, but her cheekbones look the same to me. Um, I mean, there weren't that many Shih Tzu there. But. So that's the end of it. Any questions about it so far? And we then get on to the Tibetan Spaniels. Yeah. Finnish people don't ask oh, questions. No. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm not finished. 
You are in Finland. I'm in Finland. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't happen. No. <laughs> right. Okay. I'll keep going. I'll keep going. <laughs> um, right. So here we've got Matara. This is the same Mrs. Matara Morrison that brought the apsos in very early. She brought chows in. She brought uh, samwes in. All sorts of Asian treats. Um, and these and Yezo, which is the one second from the your right, the big one, um, that was imported. And this uh, it was imported and it was used a lot in Tibetan So this was 1904. So well before the breeds all got divided. But again, they didn't really have a problem with the Tibetan terror, the Tibetan spaniels, because they looked different, like the Tibetan Mastiffs looked different, the Tibetan Samuels looked different. It was the Tibetan Terriers, Apsos, and Shih Tzu that there was a big war among them. Um, again, there are, I think at one point I said there were five different types, uh, type is a funny word, but types of Tibetan Spaniels. So this was again 1904, a Tibetan Spaniel that could look like a Tibetan spaniel today, but they didn't have the cushioning. And those of you who, if you came under me with your Tibetan spaniels, I was looking for cushioning because that's what we want now. But in fact, in the early ones, a lot of them didn't have it at all. I mean, you can see here the one that's sitting, this, this, it's very pointed in four face. This is really just to show you what they look like mm -hmm. then. And here we are in Tring again. Um, one of these was important. Yeah, Luna came in from Calcutta. So we know she was born in Calcutta in 1908, and she died in England in 1616. Um, and Bujum, uh, that was died in 17. But again, we're getting a little closer on this one to the Tibetan Spaniel. But equally, it's not, one can never be sure how they've actually preserved those dogs, you know, whether they maybe had a little bit more cushioning that we, that they didn't put in, when it, you know, it dies, it goes. How do you find the color? Or is it sort of Sorry? tan? The, the color? The color? Um, well, it, it's a bit odd that it's a solid, I've never seen a solid black with that big splash of white like mm -hmm. that recently. I mean, you get the black and white, you don't get very many of them, but you do still get black. There were no black and whites, I think, at your show. Um, oh, oh, there's black like tan, 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 mark, tan marking. Yeah, yeah the, it, it, it could be tan marking, or it could be the, the reflection. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. in a museum with behind glass. Yeah. Well, it's difficult to say. I, I don't. I didn't see it as a tan mark dog. Tan mark. Those of you don't get it in our breeds, but the, the Tibetan Mastiff. Just a point here there. That if a Tibetan Mastiff has uh, tan points above the eyes, they call it a four-eyed dog because they reckon it can see uh, danger four days in advance. So it's called four-eyed. Um, again, this is now. This is a Tibetan Spaniel. Um, and look at the coat on it, and it's heavy, or it looks heavy on the earth. And now this, okay. is, <laughs> this is Dr. Greaves, or Mrs. Greaves, I don't know, the mother. Um, but it's Tibetan Spaniel with a prick ear, and this was one of the bones of contention in the meeting. <laughs> they should have prick ears, because mine do. Um, it was nice, it was a beautiful dog. Um, Oh, in here, um, yeah, this was in 19, I think he died in 1933. Yeah, the man died in 1933, so I don't know when this was taken. It must have been pre-1933. But these were Tibetan Spaniels in a monastery. Um, and here is Daisy Grieg. That's why I looked the name up. Daisy is the sister of Dr. Grieg um, with... Tibetan Spaniels. Now we can see 
and now we've got Daisy again, and why she features so well. Now, this again, this is Lady Wakefield's Tibetan Spaniel, okay. and again we've got the, the, the prick ear. So I can only assume that it's probably come down from one of Dr. Green's, because this would have been late 40s or early 50s. And Lady Wakefield at Crufts in 50s, so that must have been late 40s. Um, I put these up purely, not, not because I know the dogs or anything about them, but just to show you what they look like in the 1960s. I think well, was one of Brain here. I think it might have been. No. Yes, it was. First of all, was Brady and Camper. Yeah, so this was one of our winners. And 65. And again, I, I didn't, I mean, I, I found it a little bit in the Tibetan Spaniels, but not that much. But I mean, a Tibetan Spaniel does not have the same front as a Lhasa. So it, you do expect this slight curvature on the inside of the leg. Again, another braided one. And this, you'd like to see this. This is, I only took it from one of my books because I couldn't find the original picture. But again, Carol and I used to go and do the photos for Anne. Um, and that was just sitting there. Cedric Hall, Cedric Hall, Cedric Hall. Anyway, the last one. Cedric Hall. Cedric yes. Um, and just showing the colours, really, of the masters there. Yeah. And this was the best Tibetan spaniel I ever saw in Nepal. It was in the 90s, and I've not seen anything better since. Um, I really don't think I have. Um, but it was nice. Oh, and this one, yeah, I, it came because we do charity work and we do injections and whatever for them. And this one was, I said, oh, a Tibetan Spaniel, oh, no, 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 it's not a Tibetan Spaniel, it's a Spitz. But it may well be, but you get an Indian Spitz in Nepal, yeah. and a lot of times the Indian Spitz has got mixed with other things, or I, when I used to go to Dharamsala in northern India in the 1980s, um, I've, I used to, on one occasion, I seemed to spend hours looking for this particular litter that was born of Lhasa Apsos and eventually got to the house um, and it was a spitz litter, it was a spitz litter. But what was interesting was that the bitch hadn't produced enough milk, so the mother of the household, who'd got her own baby, had fed the puppies her breast milk. I mean, they really do bother in their own little way, you know, it's, it's, they, they, they do try, but of course, don't have the facilities that we have, and that was ages, it wasn't recent. Um, oh, yeah, here we are. This is this is our, when I said this at some point. This was when I judged, I think it was the first time I judged in Sweden, and that's Paul Stanton, and that was my mm. best of breed winner mm. there. Um, where are we now? St. Petersburg 2020. There weren't many Tibetan Spaniels in St. Petersburg at all, you know, very few. Um, and here at the Tibetan Spaniel Association, I'm sorry, I, I understood somebody was going to be sending me pictures and they sent me like two low resolution ones. Um, so I, that's all I've got. But my winner here, well, all my major winners, the best one was different, but they were, for me, sort of typical old fashioned type. They weren't overdone. Oh, and this, again, it may or may not be a Tibetan Spaniel. I don't know whether you saw this one, Anuka, or whether I took it with you or some other time. But that was... We saw a sort of big one. Oh, the big fat, fat one. Fat, yeah, fat yeah. One. <laughs> yeah. That's what they like. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the shape was right. The shape. But <laughs> it was just big. That's right. That's now dead. That was in touch with me. Sadly, it's dying. But it was, it, did, it was 16 last time I saw it. So okay. it lived a good life, despite being fat. Um, and again, these are Tibetan Spaniel types. I can't be sure that they're real Tibetan Spaniels, but clearly they've, you know, there's something there. 
And at dog shows, I've never yet had a Tibetan Spaniel in Nepal, and I've judged a lot of shows in Nepal. So, any questions on Tibetan Spaniels before we go into Tibetan? Oh, sorry. Um, Tibetan Terriers. <laughs> right. Tibetan Terriers, Bunty Center, blah, 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 blah. 26, well, you're here, so you're Tibetan Terriers. Um, but these were the early, the early, the foundation stock of Dr. Griggs, and her mother had already bred Spaniels before her. So they, they sort of did a joint kennel with two different affixes. Um, this was born in Tibet and um, born in Tibet, but gained its championship title in the UK in 1938, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe? It died at 10, but I'm sure it got its title in 1938. Greeks again, and at the front there you see a Tibetan spaniel of theirs. And this one, I may have got the date wrong. I worked it out, oh, at the Tibetan Terrier thing, I put the date of 1949, and then I found that I'd put it somewhere else as 1930, because Bailey went backwards and forwards to Tibet. But the, what was interesting for me was the coat structure. Mm. Um, and then here, Cabradossi, um, Tibetan Terrier, um, and the um, Callisto were two very important Tibetan terriers that came over. And this one, yeah, that, Anuka yeah. saw it before me because she's taller. I was over a wall <laughs> <laughs> and we were at Henjo refugee camp. Um, and she said, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. And this I loved. I, mm. I absolutely adored the Apso. Um, it was beautiful. And what do I put here? Yeah, just here to show you the square proportion of the Tibetan Terrier. It is quite different from the last app, so. Um, again, we're now at things that I've judged. Um, the That was my first set of tickets in Tibetan Terriers. And it went to win the group and reserve best in show. And I actually put it over uh, Willie, um, Araki, fabulous Willie, who had won Best in Show at Crufts. And I wasn't liked for it, but I did get the reserve ticket. But this was lovely. <laughs> oh, and again, it's worth mentioning very quickly, Tibetan Terriers, um, that is up to size. But the breed standard originally was 14 to 17 inches. And it was actually a typing error when the breed standard was reproduced, I'm not sure in what year, that brought the size down to 16. So it now says 14 to 16, but the old standard really did say 14 to 17. It was just an error. So really, we've got to forgive a little bit on those big ones in Tibetan terriers. There aren't many of these, but this is lovely. Um, this was an Italian artist that lived in uh, China, and this was the Tibetan Mastiff, um, called Tibetan Mountain Dog, I think technically, but in uh, what was it, the 17th century, really, or it could have been 18th century early. And here we've got the siring that was brought into Britain um, by the Prince of Wales. And this, again, I'm going off at a tangent, and I won't go off the tangent for very long, I'm sorry. But uh, from Jay Singh in Nepal. Jay, I met at the World Dog Show in Austria. I can't remember the year, 1990 probably. And he was the man who exported the first, this one, Tubo, from Nepal, first event master from Nepal to Germany. And in fact, it's really sort of the great, 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 great grandfather of pretty much everything in Europe and America now. Um, and these people in Tibet now who've been to my three and our talk yeah. on the Tibetan Mastiff are saying that, oh, well, you know, it was a bad Tibetan Mastiff that he sent and he, he shouldn't have sent it because it was too bad. 
And, and I think, oh, poor man, you know, he's 93. He's been married <laughs> all his life. And, and now these young upstarts are really decrying the knowledge. And everybody, everybody in Europe really listened very, very carefully to what Jay said. You know, Jay really bothered. I mean, whatever. Yeah. That's, yeah. the, that's the reason I put that picture up. And here are just some of the examples of the dogs that I've judged. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that the dogs I've judged looked like, in my oh, mind, Tibetan yeah, Mastiffs, mm -hmm. not like the big, grotesque, mm -hmm. heavily jowled, monster-legged, but probably photoshopped Tibetan Mastiffs mm -hmm. that are on the mm -hmm. Facebook at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, okay, right, end of story. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry, thank you. Okay, charitable work in Nepal. Uh, quick, 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 quick. Okay, I'm sorry. So in Nepal, we do quite a lot of Tibetan terriers here, more than anything else. Um, but we do do, and I particularly chose the Tibetan terrier, Tibetan breed pictures. Um, but we do, we have an animal charity. Um, it has to be called an animal charity because the Tibetan, the, the Nepali government, say that animals, sorry, dogs are of no help to society, but animals are. So we have to call ourselves animal charity and we have to do the occasional something on a goat or a buffalo or a, a bat. We've done uh, all sorts of odd things, but purely because we're animals, not just dogs. Um, and also what happens is that Sometimes when people come over, they bring old collars and leads and brushes and things, and we give them out. And the Tibetans are really particular about what they're getting, you know. Um, oh, I don't want the red lead, I want the blue one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the fact that it's 10 years old doesn't matter. Um, and I hear, oh, this is actually a video. It's, just, it's worth putting on. To, uh, does it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's time. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Um, but this was. It should. Not going to. Doesn't work. But whatever. This is a picture, and there was a little video with it. Um, but not all the dogs are very easy to deal with, obviously. Um, and this lady is ever so proud because her dog it has had its injections year by year by year. And she says, sorry, oh, my dog is good, but the next one, angry dog. And she says, <laughs> and cure me, and, and that's her. She says, oh, angry dog, and she's trying to bite me and pretend to bite me <laughs> to say that the dog's going to bite. And then on the next picture, which, yeah, it, this was the angry dog. <laughs> and it, and the, I thought it was a video, but it's not. But it really did. It was awful, but we got it. Um, so they're not always easy. And I hate it when dogs are netted for injections, mm -hmm. but they do do it in the fall. They, they seem to have to. And it, just a picture of a dog being injected. And they come from all sorts of places. Um, Cameron is a guest of ours, and, but has become a friend over time. But I mean, I don't know where he came from, but people come on bicycles. They come across, if we do it by a lake, you can sort of see them all coming, and then they're waving their injection <laughs> certificates on the way home. <laughs> so they've actually gone really out of their way to bring their dogs. What is very sad to me is that always when we do, they're always free, the rabies injections, um, but we do the rabies injections free, but we always take a few, what we call five and one, I don't know what you call them anymore here, but the five and one, simple lepto and kettle cough, whatever. Um, we take a few things and we say, well, we will only charge you, you know, what we pay for them, which is about, what is it now, about 780. So maybe five euros, five and a half euros, something like that. Five euros, say. And almost nobody says yes to that. They cannot see. The rabies is what matters to them because the rabies, they know they could die from rabies. They're not going to die if the dog gets distemper it's not going to die. I mean, they are not going to die. Um, it's, so it's, and I know five euros is a lot for them, mm -hmm. for most of them, but I wish they'd take more interest. And uh, this is, I don't know if any Tibetan terrier people maybe know the Harris's from New yes, Zealand. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, so yes, they, they yes. came over 
ages ago now and gave. I saw them in October. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they came over and brought brushes and things to give out. Again. And then this is one of our recent camps. And when you get a lot of dogs that need attention, and we in this particular one, we did a proper veterinary check for all the dogs and the odd goat. Um, but the, the, there are so many of them that we, and this is near our agro project that we set up recently, um, but they all come and register first of all, and then they go off and get their, you know, the women and the dogs or whatever are staying somewhere else while they're ready to do all the paperwork for us. Um, we also have a charity for children, um, which is the Dibijoji Education Trust. It was a school, um, but it, was, it wasn't a school. We have rebuilt a school, but that's a different matter. Ours really it was a hostel, but then COVID came and it's changed everything. I shan't go into the details, but you know, some of these children were so poor that they, well, they were all poor, but some of them were from what are called um, uh, daily wage earners. And because when COVID came, nobody was working, nobody was allowed to work. So although the children didn't have a proper mother and father, or they might have had one, they were still belonged to a family and that family went back to the Tarai or to some rural area and took the children and brought with them. So our numbers depleted. And so as a result, we had only a small plot of land, but it was expensive land. So we sold that and we bought a bigger plot of land. And we thought, when you look at this, it's completely um, This is the children when we had all the children with us. We had 35, that was the top number. Um, and then we moved here, this is Gadgetcot. Where, uh, where some of the children came with us, but not all. Um, and now, it, 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 I don't know, it's just all changed. And we've decided it's too much of a responsibility to have these little ones under our control. Because we've had cases where mother has come as a single mother, left child with us because she can't afford to look after it. And then about two weeks or three weeks later, Daddy comes up and says, you've stolen my boy. Um, and we have to give him back because the wife didn't say she got a husband, but she had. And he obviously wants the boy to work for him. So um, so now we are, oh, how did I get that one like that? But we, we so, <laughs> sorry, so, um, now we are looking after young monks, all of which are very poor. Uh, but that way they are, they're under the umbrella of the monastery, so they're the monastery's responsibility, not ours, but we still are going to help them um, in a lot of different ways, like taking them skipping ropes, because they don't have anything, you know, they're still children, and they may in adult cult, adulthood not be um, monks, they, you know, they may decide not to be monks when they get older, they've only been put into the monastery because the families can't afford to look after them. Yeah. Some will, will remain monks, but some won't. Could you teach them how to brush lassos? So <laughs> 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 um, right, and again, because these are hockey sticks that were given to our original children, we had a hockey player come over and she brought sticks with her. Um, so now, because we haven't got those children, this is the picture of the children, we've, we've now given the hockey sticks to the little monks. So <laughs> hockey sticks are getting recycled, clothes are getting recycled. Um, and this is one of the monastery, this is the monastery school that we're working with, maybe that was a different one. But there, um, you can flick on quickly, I think there's another, but they've got 32 children. But when I say 32 children, they are up to the age of 20, but there's like an 18 year old in class two because they've not had any education at all, just none, zilch. So they started right at the bottom. So you get a class with people from the age of 17 to 18, all in the same thing. And every morning they have to bring, this is just a hall, it's a community hall, they bring the whiteboards out to make a place for their class. So this is the, um, the stage and you've got two classes on the stage. And this is this is class two actually. So you can see you've got some little ones and some big ones. Um, and then we give things. 
like this was a winter picture, um, and we give, um, in this case, it was red, everything has to be red, red slippers, warm, fur-lined, not real mm -hmm. fur-lined slippers to keep their feet warm, because you know, they're just walking around in their little flip-flops um, all through the winter. Um, this is the agricultural project that we've got running at the moment. Um, that's how it started, and then we've, we've layered it, and this is as it is, it's not very green now, because the greenness will come with the monsoon, um, but it's big. And the um, agricultural department has been very good. They've allowed us, free of charge, all the plants for the animals. Yes. And so what we're trying to teach them to do is, that, again, I haven't put pictures in, but if people want to feed their goats or their buffalo, they climb a tree and they lop all the branches off at the top and feed them those that greenery. So you're left with a tree with nothing on it. But in fact, if they learn how to grow it at ground floor level, the, the goats can just nibble away at what they want. And the agriculture department has been really good because they can go and get pretty much anything he wants, whenever he wants it. All we have to pay for is transport, which is great. Um, and we've now got how many goats? 43, is it? Some yeah, time. so the, the goats, and we're aiming at doing goat's cheese. Um, and we, we are doing agricultural programs so that we're training the poorer, younger people. That Nepal has got so much potential for agricultural growth and you know growth of it. goat's cheese just doesn't happen in Nepal. They do say they sell goat's cheese now, but it doesn't taste anything like goat's cheese. Um, but we, we're going to learn how to make it and teach people how to make it so that they've got something yeah. to do. And we've now got um, two cows and a baby cow. Happens, thankfully, to be a girl. Um, because you can't kill a cow in Nepal. In, well, in Nepal, because it's Hindu. Um, so if, it's horrible because if a, if, a, if a baby, a bullock, a baby male cow is born, they just let it free and it, it just got a horrible life, mm. just scrounging its way through life until it dies of natural causes. Um, we've got a, a nice big um, greenhouse. So we're going to, this is where animal, uh, sorry, human food is, is grown or will be grown. And saying about um, recycling, the children's clothes we've given to a local school, it's a lot of local villages. Um, and here is it's a particularly interesting area which we've we've bought that we're working on. I mean, it's just at the beginning of everything happening. There's going to be an agricultural course as soon as we get back, which will be our first. We've got monks, young monks coming to stay for two months in June and July. We've got dormitory accommodation. We've only got 35 beds, but it could take 50 people if needed, two dormitories, one for each sex. Um, and this, the hill that it's on, was a, uh, there was a palace because there used to be um, many different kingdoms in the four small kingdoms. Um, and the palace is gone, but this was the secretary's home. Um, so we've, it's taken us four years to get it. We paid the deposit on it four years ago, but finally we've got the secretary's house now and we're transforming that so that when people come to visit, there will be rooms in there that will be pleasant um, and interesting. Um, the other thing that we do up there, or partly from my home, is that if people ever want um, memory stones for dogs, we were trying to find a way, because COVID nobody was paying any money, everybody was sponsoring a child, dropped out, and whatever, we all know what COVID was like. Um, and one of our supporters, Jeanette, I don't know how, but she just suggested that um, we do, you know, why can't you do some memory stones? And it's really taken off. So what happens is if people want a stone in memory of either a dog or two dogs, really, pretty much the maximum on one stone, or of their kennel, um, we can do something and I paint the stone at home, check it out with them as to whether it's correct or not. Wasn't there some people for, for her a late husband? Yeah, you can have a few husband. And I just try and give people the idea, but there's never been another one. I put in my Billy 
my, my, my granddad's buggery guard when he died. And I did a stone for Billy, just a little stone. Yeah. So we could do anything, you know. Yeah. So if somebody wants a stone for a snail or a frog, <laughs> we could do it. Um, and the idea is that we are, a long story takes too long to explain, but we are making a garden for the stones. But Nepal being Nepal, we got a little piece at the top of the hill, which is what we wanted, working on it for about 18 months, got there, Dibia went with a lawyer, and the owner of the land, and it turned out not to be his land at all. It was his older brother's land, but he thought he thought all his life it was his land. So we had to go back to square one, do the whole thing again with the older brother, who is now who became 92 and then died. So we're back to square one.